Hello and welcome to a soft spoken story time with me. I hope that you are ready to relax. I hope that you will enjoy the story that I have chosen. I have chosen a story that I won't be reading all of it, but I will be putting the link down below. So, if you would like to purchase it yourself and finish it, you're more than welcome to. One of my dear friends that I miss so dearly because of this quarantine wrote this. Her and her late husband. It is called The Season of the Owl. Book one. The Legacy of Treywood. By Christina Coxspence and Gregory Peacox. Chapter 1 Spittlecrack. Do you understand the risk you're taking? Seth asked his wife. He looked out over the snow-covered land and couldn't suppress a shiver. Even though he had lived in in search all his life and was used to the frigid air. No one stayed outside for long during the day in the killing cold of the two-week winter season, called Spittlecrack, and no one dared venture out at night. After the feeble light of the cloud-blocked sun retreated from the ice and darkness fell, the temperature became impossible to survive. Brianna laughed, not in a mocking way, but gentle and full of love for her husband. I've lived here long enough to know what Spittlecrack is like. I'm going to take Runner for a walk right around the area for a few minutes. I won't go within a hundred yards of the rise. She pointed to a small hill some four hundred yards in the distance. The guards, the knights, and you are right here. What could possibly happen to me with so many people around to protect me? I've only ridden since I could walk. I'm a better rider than you are, and now you think me too delicate? She patted the beginning swell of her belly. We're as tough as the men we marry, she kissed Seth, at least when it comes to horses. In the end, he couldn't understand why. Seth relented, reasoning. They all were suffering from cabin fever due to spittle crack, and Brianna, like everyone else, needed a break, if only for a few moments. He knew how much pleasure writing gave her, and he couldn't bring himself to deprive her of it, despite it being completely against his better judgment. He also knew how overprotective he could be. She would never be out of his sight or the sight of the guards or knights. What harm could a short ride do? Before long, he was checking Long Rider's saddle. He trusted Anders, the stable master, but he nevertheless double-checked. Before Brianna mounted the horse, she threw her arms around Seth, showing her pleasure in being given the chance to take a short ride. He held her tighter and longer than usual, the anxiety never leaving his eyes. He couldn't shake the feeling. Something was wrong. Yet he did not listen to his instinct telling him not to let his wife ride. He released his hold on her and stroked her white blonde hair and took and looked deep into her green eyes. He smiled. 
the same beautiful smile he always gave her when he'd given her something she wanted. No other man in In Search would let his wife rule him so. Seth helped her onto her horse. He draped a gray double-ended pouch made to lie over the shoulders, over her, and put positioned one of the pouches inside her cape, so it fell in front of her, and the bottom of the pouch just touching her stomach, the other resting and mid-back. She immediately felt the warmth of the heat soaked under stones in the pouches. Brianna leaned to kiss her husband, but she didn't have to go far. Seth stood head and shoulders above most, as all the tree would mended. No other man in In Search is as wonderful as you. She kissed him and gazed into his sapphire blue eyes as she ran her hand through his dark shoulder-length hair. With a tug on the reins, she set off a slow trot and looked back at him with a beautiful smile. Care to join me? Arden, Seth turned to his ever-present squire. Saddle wind dancer. I think I will join my wife. He wondered why he hadn't thought of this before. After she left the castle yard, through its north gate, Brianna switched between a walk and a slow trot in large circles, never going far as she had promised, and stayed a short distance from the last set of guards. Seth decided it was silly of him to worry so much. He heard Arden bringing Wind Dancer out of the stable at the same time. Brianna was at the far end of the circle she was riding. Suddenly, a strange trilling filled the air, a sound tainted with foul magic that sends chills up Seth's spine as a white, hot band of fear squeezed tightly around his gut. He turned in time to see Longrunner raise his front legs in the air and let out a whinny of terror. From the corner of his eye, Seth saw a figure on the left of the rise. He wore a black robe with the hood pulled low over his head. Despite the distance, Seth could see the figure held a small flute-like instrument to his mouth. With unnaturally long fingers, Brianna's horse hit the ground and bolted away from the castle. Everyone on the castle grounds froze, as if fear were holding them in place. A sudden gust of bone-chilling wind blew the heavy black fur-lined cape Seth wore straight behind him. The crimson and silver strip at the bottom fluttered in waves. In seconds, he was chilled to the bone. In a matter of minutes, his skin, protected only by his black wool shirt and black traggle leather doublet would start to freeze. He glanced at the rise again, just in time to see the wildly running horse, the only horse losing all its reason, disappear over with his beloved wife on its back. The hooded figure was gone. Dear God, Seth claimed, in dawning horror, what was I thinking? Were any of us thinking at all? The castle grounds burst into chaos, 
before Seth could turn, he saw the knights running for the stables and guards running for the rides. Anders, Seth shouted. The man came out of the stables to see his Garen mount, his horse almost kicking Arden in the head as he did. Anders, get me a great coat now. Anders immediately fetched one of the great coats, kept inside the stables, handing it to Seth. He asked, Where are you going, Garen Treywood, to find Brianna? Seth rode out, the horse in full run. Anovian, please let me find her before it's too late. The great black stallion raced out of control through the snow-covered forest. The beast's sleek mane and tail were flying straight out behind him, like a flag in a gale. Breath after heaving breath came forth in great jets of steam, turning into ice crystals frosting his face. The tiny crystals swirled into little cyclones as he ran through the icy cloud before the shards floated slowly to the snow beneath his pounding hooves. On and on the horse madly galloped into the forest, not knowing what it was scared of yet, still fearing for its life, as if all the fall of Dranek were chasing it. Its loose reins occasionally snagged an upturned stick and turned its head with a sharp twist, first one way and then the other. The horse was so full, filled with fear, he simply turned in the direction of the pool and kept going. In a brief rare ray of morning sun breaking through the clouds of spittle crack. The sweat frozen on the horse's hair threw prisms of light onto the snow as the animal flew by. If not for the life and death struggle of the frantic young woman atop the horse, the scene could have been from a master's artist's canvas. The black horse and the wine-colored leather cape Brianna wore stood in stark relief against the background of the snow-covered hills. As the forest began to thicken, the hapless horse crashed against the tree branches with bone-jarring force. Brianna, her heart filled with the same unnatural terror the horse felt, tried desperately to maintain a grip on the saddle. With one freezing hand while the other she tried again and again to catch a dragging rein, to somehow bring the terrified animal under control. Each time her hand was smacked cruelly away, just shy of her goal, by pitiless tree branches. The steaming blood from the cuts froze instantly as the deadly cold touched it. More than once, the horse leaped to a clear an obstacle in its path, throwing her into its muscular neck. Its ice-encrusted mane left those same ice crystals clinging torturously to her face. Too filled with fear, to think about trying a risky demount, Brianna clung to the horse. Her hands and face had long since gone numb. Her chest, stomach, and legs were already feeling the sharp sting of frostbite. Her cloak flew behind her, threatening to snag on something and yank her off the horse, which could mean death. Brianna was terrified, in pain and freezing to death. 
The two people she loved most in the world were at the forefront of her mind. How could she do this to Seth? He'd begged her not to ride, Long Runner. Not in her condition, and not in this weather. The bravest of men, he had reminded her, will not go riding during Spittlecrack unless they had absolutely no choice. And even then, they would only go for the day and never alone. He will forever blame himself, she thought. But I was the one who wouldn't listen. Why? She knew. The warmest part of the day in which she was literally freezing to death now was a testament to how dangerous Spittlecrack was. And the warm peak lasted a mere few hours. If the horse didn't throw and kill her, she would most certainly freeze to death on top of the madly running animal. She'd seen it happen once when she was ten years old. Her family had stayed in in search for a few months to finish some business concerning their small fleet of ships. Brianna had been miserably cold the whole time. She was used to the warmer climate of Windermere, with its many volcanoes and hot springs. She'd soon realized a normal day of Ensearch's winter was a warm summer day compared to the killing cold of Spittlecrack. During Spittlecrack's first week, a man had ridden through the unyielding cold all night bearing a message from a nearby town begging for help. It was in the middle of an outbreak of clitoned sickness. It was a vicious disease that sometimes, not often, thankfully, appeared during Spittlecrack. It could run through an entire town in two weeks, killing every living thing. Unfortunate enough be affected. Worse, yet it came with the unrelenting cold, so towns and villages were usually unable to get help. The horse, knowing the way, had arrived in Dagenshain at dawn the next morning. Its rider long frozen to its back, his teeth set in firm determination. The message held tightly in his frozen hand. The horse was mercifully killed after the dead rider was removed. Unintelligible words of comfort were whispered to the quivering beast to ease the agony it must have felt, most of its body frozen, yet refusing to yield to death. A heavy crossbow bolt through its heart had ended its suffering quickly. After all they'd witnessed, they had still been awed when the frozen legs kept the horse remaining upright. Its ice-covered head had only dropped a few inches, stopping abruptly like a broken wind-up toy. Her father and Trellels, the title of, the res of respect used for Divians who were empathic healers, from the Abbey of the Celestial Night had left ten days later on the first lifting day of Spittlecrack. But their efforts and that of the messenger had been in vain. The mysterious Cleton sickness had claimed the entire town, twisting every thing once living human and animal, beyond recognition. They had quickly burned the town and the bodies. The other person she thought about was her baby, hers and Seth's first child, who was nestled warmly and securely in her belly. 
The thought that her foolish actions might cost her child its life made her cry harder. The tears freezing on the sides of her face. She was just beginning to show, and Seth had teased her about eating too much. She usually returned the remark with a pillow, but one particularly bad night she had thrown a flower crop at him. He'd quit teasing her after that. And no Vian help us, she prayed out loud, as the thick yardwood trees lashed at her slamming against her chest and belly. Please send us a silver one of your messengers. Please don't let my poor innocent baby suffer for my stupidity. Brianna waited feverishly for a miracle, but if the creator heard, he wasn't listening. The forest was getting thicker, and between the huge yard wood trees stood slender rods of knees that looked like skinny, black-clad sentries awaiting orders from spring to return to life. Brianna lowered her head to hide her numbed face from the merciless wind. Her right eye was frozen shut. She was making an effort to open it by rubbing her face against her sleeve. When what she feared came to pass, the horse tried to leap over a large fallen tree trunk and as it leaped, its back hooves skidded in the icy snow. The stallion went into the air sideways. Brianna's grass was torn loose as she flew silently through the air before slamming into the snow. The horse fell on top of her. Frantic hooves tore the ground by her face as the neck and shoulders of the horse rolled over her, gouging a hole in the snow beside her. Brianna gasped as the horse's shoulders drove her face into the deep snow. As cold as it was, It was also a cushion. Had it been spring, she would have been crushed to death. With a few kicks of its mighty hooves, the animal righted itself. He left his mistress gasping for air and covered in ice in the middle of nowhere as he plunged headlong into the woods once more. Brianna clawed her way out of the snow, coughing and gagging. Her first full breath was mostly snow, and she feared she would suffocate. Her right eye was still frozen shut, and her face, hands, feet, and thighs were numb. Nevertheless, she managed to crawl to a nearby nice tree. Its thin branches offered no shelter, but the thick weave of top ground roots would at least let her sit atop the snow and not in it. With fumbling fingers, she managed to gather her cloak around her shivering body, pulling the hood low on her forehead and around her face, but it didn't help. Desperate, she looked into the gray pouch Seth had draped over her. To her dismay, the small, heat-absorbing utter stones had all but lost their heat and were barely glowing, tying embers among the cold ashes of her hopes. She knew the cold of Spittlecrack could suck the life out of a living thing, but she hadn't known it could suck the heat, which usually lasted an entire day, out of an utter stone so quickly. With a strangled cry, she bitterly acknowledged it wouldn't be enough to keep her from freezing. The cold wind of Spittlecrack continued cutting through the cloak and into her agonized and weary flesh. Without warning, waves of sharp pain raced across her belly. Brianna's frozen throat croaked out a scream. More of fear than pain, she doubled over. One of her frozen hands loosely grabbed a nice root for support. 
the pain ebbed and slowed. She realized the throbbing she was feeling was some nothing more than her tired and exhausted muscles cramping with the cold. I had forever been intense, and now the cold wind knifing into her body brought it with it uncontrollable shivering, causing her teeth to chatter. The falling snow did its best to cover her, making her part of the sterile whiteness that was the forest during Spittlecrack. Brianna was freezing to death. Her body would be covered by snow and light, undisturbed through frost killer. The warm north winds ending Spittlecrack until the melting snow yielded its grisly burden in spring. Or worse, a wandering terracot, an evil spirit that possessed the body of anyone unfortunate enough to freeze to death. In Spittlecrack would find her. Only the stoutest of hearts whispered legends about the terrifying creatures, and that was by a roaring fire behind locked doors. Some believed terracots were a living cancerous mass that crawled out of the obliteration, ending the Earl War, when the Shun, the Elder Race, destroyed themselves. Others believed the creatures were the corrupted souls of humans who were damned to Dranak. Whatever their true origins, terracots were fearless in a human host, stronger than a bull in full rage. They killed for the joy of killing. They silently moved through the freezing oceans of snow, searching for the frozen, lifeless corpse of those lost during Spittlecraft. If one found such an unfortunate person, the body sealer possessed and reanimated the corpse for its use. If Turcotts found her, it would use her body and more horribly, her unborn baby's body, for its bloody, merciless killing spree until the warmth of Frost Killer ended Spittlecrack. Brianna began to cry once more her fresh tears quickly freezing like the others. Forgive me, Seth, she said out loud, but only the white, uncaring forest heard her. I've killed myself and our child. Her words were becoming more difficult to form as her body froze. Brianna's extremities were already without feeling whatsoever. Both her eyes were now frozen shut, and she could feel the steely fingers of cold reaching deeper and deeper into her body, her heart, her lungs, her baby. The little white ball that was Brianna slowly fell to the right into the deeper snow sinking until all that was visible was a bit of shoulder, which was quickly being covered by the silent snow. A fleeting thought ran through her mind. She must get up before she no longer cared. But she was suddenly comfortable, as if she were wrapped in a white blanket. She knew the warmth was death. It was spreading through her body, and for the first time in hours, it was as if she was sitting beside a fire, warm and safe, under a heavy blanket, asleep. Sweet, blessed sleep filled her body with euphoria. She knew she was fading. Good night, my child. It would have been nice to see your face. She silently said to her baby. She walked to the edge of darkness and stepped off. Dylan, Anovian's first warrior, was perched on the branch of a tree in Deep Score Woods, the forest that was rumored to be enchanted on Trey Woodlands, when he heard Brianna's desperate prayers to the Creator. 
Dylan and his consort, Shalindria, the Ural spirit who was the guardian of man, had sensed the denizen of Dranak when the servant of evil had entered Nyadin Woods, where Treywood Castle stood. It was a Durazat, a loyal worshipper of one of the five elite leaders of Dranak, who was favored with rank and power. Neiman was his name. But he was not just a Durazat. He was much more powerful, an ancient agent of the Dark Lord of Dranak himself. Durkis and the Drankis had been trapped in Dranak for untold millennia. And in all that time, they had been ceaseless in their efforts to come back to Nortel. The war wrath must have been close to succeeding, or he wouldn't have seen this child as a threat. Close indeed if he sent Naaman to destroy the unburned pig. But the Durazat had made a mistake. He must not have counted on the horse running into Deep Score Woods. Naaman was powerless in Deep Score and could cause no more harm. But what he had already done in his lord, Durkin's name was enough. The first warrior had defeated Durkin's once. He had been the one who trapped Durkin's and the three former Ural spirits who had followed the war wraith in Dranic. But not without a high price. Durkins had managed to curse Dylan, trapping him in his owl form. And the Shalindra had been trapped in deep score woods. If Durkins and his followers broke through the realms to threaten mankind, Dylan could not challenge him now. Not in his present form of a snow owl. He would need a Sirkrin, an avatar, one who would accept his gifts and agree to be the protector and defender of mankind. The Sirkrin would come from the descendants of the pact maker Nicodemus Treywood. And the child within Brianna was part of this ancient bloodline. The half Ural spirit let out a sigh as he thought of the terrible battle to come, bringing destruction and horrors in its wake. Countless sacrifices would have to be made if man had any chance of surviving. Sacrifices beginning this day. Dylan knew he must save the family regardless of the risks, and there were risks if he merged with the child now. The great snow owl shuddered in spite of himself. He had no idea what effect an early merging would have on the developing babe. But Brianna and the child would die if he did not intervene. There was no more time for questions. He knew what had to be done. His huge wings lifted his body into the air, and he silently moved to follow the horse. The season of the owl was upon them again. The call had indeed come and he must answer it now, be it early or not.